Welcome to the chapter on long-term debt and bonds payable. Uh, we will continue to move forward through this chapter in actually quite a few different videos. Uh, so just realize there will be many of these. To start with, uh, let's talk about the long-term liabilities and the different information we'll be covering. We're going to start with talking about uh, bonds payables. We'll move to long-term notes payables, and then we'll do reporting and analyzing the liabilities uh, and really how all this information comes into play. So this particular lecture is part of uh, describing the nature of bonds. We're not going to talk about accounting for bond issuances yet. That'll be in the next lecture. Now, long-term debt uh, represents the probable sacrifice of economic benefits arising from a present obligations that are not payable within a year of the operating cycle, whichever is longer. Uh, overall, we are going to look at a variety of long-term debt and the accounting and disclosure issues related to them. <clears throat> long-term debt overall um, is an obligation that requires some type of a formal agreement between parties involved that is going to perhaps have certain covenants and restrictions attached to it. Um, these are for the protection of both the lenders and the borrowers. And those restic restrictions are found in the bond indenture or the note agreement. Uh, they will include information related to amounts such as authorized to be issued, interest rates, due dates, call provisions, security for the debt sinking fund requirements. All of this is going to be relayed in those agreements. Uh, important issues that are related to long-term debt are always and should always be included in the financial statements um, or the notes to the financial statements. So included in your long-term debt liabilities are bonds payables, uh, mortgage payables, long-term notes payables, lease obligations, pension obligations. Um, we actually dial down deeper to leases and pensions in later classes. Uh, just note that they exist. Bonds and notes payables are sources of debt funding for corporations, and they actually are the main sources of debt funding for corporations. Within the bylaws of an organization, you will find uh, what the rules and prescriptions are related to whether or not the board or the officers or uh, it has to actually go to stockholder vote <coughs> in order to enter into these types of contracts. So I actually did uh, go to a couple of different locations and I have here um, the bylaws for uh, Altria Group. <clears throat> so Altria Group is uh, the, the parent company of which Philip Morris is attached to. And as you recall, the text actually kind of touches base on Philip Morris. So your bylaws provide all the basic rules for uh, how the corporation is going to be ran. Um, these are the amended bylaws, so give me just one second here. <clears throat> so in here, the chairman of the board of directors, the president, any vice president, the treasurer, and such other persons as the board of directors may authorize shall have the power to effect loans and advances at any time for the corporation from any bank, trust company, or other institution or from any corporation, firm, or individual, and for such loans and advances may make execute and deliver promissory notes or other evidences of indebtedness of the corporation 
and as security for the payment of any and all loans, advances, indebtedness, and liability of the corporation, may pledge, hypothecate, or transfer any and all stocks, securities, and other personal property at any time held by the corporation, and to that end, endorse, assign, and deliver the same. So here you will see that in the bylaws of the corporation, the authority has been given <clears throat> to the chairman of the board, uh, key officers such as the president and the vice presidents, uh, treasurers, and then again, anybody that the board may authorize to engage in establishing uh, liability, long-term or short-term, for the organization. Other areas where you may find in the bylaws that may be uh, applicable are contracts. And in talking about who has the power and authority to bind the, comp the corporation by contract, um, or to pledge its credit or render it liable for any purpose or to any amount. Uh, so for Altria Group, this is the chairman of the board of directors, the president, the chief operating officer, any vice president, the treasurer, I think I said that twice, my apologies, the secretary, and other persons that the board or the chairman may have authorized to execute any contract or instrument on behalf of the corporation. So in this instance, it does not actually have to go back to shareholder vote if you are engaging in a uh, long-term notes payable, mortgage payable, or a bond. <clears throat> I just wanted to show you uh, how this actually is worded out in a variety of bylaws. We can go to the Pepsi bylaws, which I also have here. And they read very similarly. Uh, every corporation's bylaws are going to be unique. But Pepsi say that except as authorized pursuant to a resolution of the board or these bylaws that no officer, agent, or employee shall have the power to bind the company by any contract or engagement. So in this case, it needs to go to the board um, in order to uh, sign a contract or enter into a loan. Whereas underneath Altria Company, there are specific officers uh, that have been indicated that have those rights. So we will go ahead and drop that back down and go back to your PowerPoint, maybe. <clears throat> the covenants that are attached to long-term liabilities or to bonds um, are in place in order to protect, protect the creditor and also to some degree the issuer. Uh, by placing specific restrictions on the actions of the issuer or the borrower. Uh, banks may employ covenants to ensure that borrowed funds are used for stated purposes. So if you secure a loan, long-term notes payable from a bank, and you cite reason X, Y, Z, you provide maybe a business plan, uh, the bank has a vested interest in ensuring that their money is used for the purpose that they provided it for. Compliance, covenant compliance uh, is audited by the creditors or the trustees. And if by chance the corporation was to fall into covenant default, then the creditor can call the loan or the bond due um, immediately. Many banks use covenants in their loan agreements, and these are very similar to those that are found in bond issues. Uh, affirmative covenants are actions that the firm agrees to take during the term of the loan. So this is things such as they will provide financial statements, uh, cash budgets, they will carry insurance on specific assets. So to think about this, when you have a car loan and you have that requirement to carry full coverage insurance, that is actually a loan covenant. Um, they may have insuring against business risks. Uh, there may be something regarding the minimum levels of networking capital. Negative covenants would be things such as uh, actions the firm will not take. This could be 
uh, agreements not to merge with other firms, um, not to pledge assets that are used as security to other lenders, um, not to make or guarantee loans to other firms. Um, typically in common, uh, especially with closely held companies, you'll find there is a there might be a limit on the officer's compensation. In private lending agreements, these different uh, covenants can have something including like maybe a debt to equity ratio requirement. Uh, cash level requirements. There may be a bank covenant that requires you to hold X amount of cash on hand in an account at the bank, or you may be required to hold all of your operating funds at that specific institution. Uh, these can come in a variety of different ways um, and a bunch of different flavors. Bonds themselves. So we just kind of just talked about long-term debt uh, and attached a little bit of information to it about bonds because covenants and restrictions, uh, the nature of bonds are long-term debt. Uh, so this does apply to bonds. But now we're going to really just start talking strictly about bonds for a little while. Um, bonds are financial debt instruments. And especially in the case of corporate bonds, which are issued by firms, there is some level of default risk that are attached to them. There is, whether remote or probable, uh, a chance that the corporation may not be able to pay the interest obligations or the face value of the bonds at maturity. Therefore, bonds are subject to a credit risk rating. Uh, the contract. So this is the formal agreement uh, of the bond, is known as the bond indenture, and it represents a promise to pay. Uh, and that promise is to pay a specific amount of money on a specific date, and then uh, perhaps to pay periodic interest at specified rates based on the maturity amount of the bond. The maturity amount of the bond is also known as the face value. Uh, most of the time, bonds have a $1,000 face value. And typically, interest payments are made semi-annually. Uh, corporations, such as businesses, will use this when they have a very large need of capital. And that amount is just really too much for one lender to supply. Or for one lender to supply it, the risk is so high for them that they're going to charge a higher interest rate. So corporations then what they do is they basically take up this need and they chunk it up and break it up. And then a lot of lenders can participate. So the risk on any one lender is substantially lower at a $1,000 face value than say 1.7 million. Therefore the interest rate that would be borne on that thousand would be much less. Um, we'll talk a little bit about bond issues in the next one. Uh, just know that bonds can either be, you know, a direct issue or they may be sold through an underwriter. Uh, there are some key terms that you really do need to basically have committed to memory. And this is for a variety of reasons. One, just for your working knowledge. Um, but two, and most importantly, is that this is... Uh, very specific information when it comes to bonds. So I'm going to really quick uh, kind of go over some bond terms that you should know. Uh, these may appear on your exams. These may appear in your homework. Uh, and these may actually appear on exams such as the CPA exam. So face or maturity value. Remember, those two are going to be synonymous. Face value and maturity value represents the amount that is paid to the bondholder at maturity. So this is when the bond has run its issue and you reach that end date. 
stated or coupon interest rate. This is the rate at which bonds pay cash interest. Uh, the rate is stated on the bond, um, and it is typically expressed as an annual percentage rate. Uh, so for example, if the rate is 6% and the bond's face value is 1,000, then one bond will pay $60 of an interest each year. Keep in mind that if it's semi-annual, then at each payment, they will receive 30. Uh, there's that fractionating of time that you need to take into account. The interest payment dates are the prescribed dates that the bond will pay the cash interest. Uh, as we said before, semi-annual semi -annual interest uh, is pretty much the norm in the rule of thumb. That doesn't mean it's the only thing out there. It's just the ones that you're typically going to find. Anything other than that is going to be unusual. Not wrong, just unusual. Uh, so market interest rate has two other synonyms that will go with that. That is yield and effective. So we could have the yield interest rate or the effective interest rate. Um, I know that there's a lot of terms and unfortunately this is just one of those where we have uh, used different nomenclature uh, for the same purpose. This is the rate equating the sum of the present values of cash interest annuity and the face value single payment with a bond price. So, for example, if you have a 6% $1,000 bond that was issued for $900, the market interest rate is going to equate the $900 amount with the present value of the annuity of $60, that's 6% 1000 face value, and the 1000 face value that will be received in the future. The market rate is the true compounded rate of return on the bond. Uh, this rate is determined by the market and is not going to be on the face of the bond or in the bond indenture. So your market re interest rate, your effective interest rate, these are things that are going to change based on how the market is reacting at any given point in time. Now keep in mind that the market changes based off supply and demand, uh, bond Bond amounts in the market can change based on creditworthiness of the organization because there is some default risk that is associated with them. The bond date is the planned issuance date. This is the date that is listed on the bond. <clears throat> the issuance date is the date the bonds are actually issued. Uh, this date cannot be earlier than the bond date, but it may come later. Uh, this information is not on the actual bond, but just so you're aware. Maturity date is the end of the bond term. This is the date when the corporation is going to pay that maturity or face value. Other terms that uh, come into play as we move forward, uh, some of them apply to the types of bonds. Bond term, this is the period from the issuance date to the maturity date. This is the period that the bond is out at play. Uh, some of the things that you'll want to take into account are things like bond issue costs. Uh, so there is actual costs of printing, registering, and marketing the bonds. These are things that the corporation will need to pay for. Accrued interest on a bond sale. This is the amount of interest based on the coupon interest rate. And the coupon interest rate is that rate at which the bond is paying their cash interest. This is the APR on the face of the bond. Um, between the issuance date and the immediately preceding interest payment date. So if your issuance date is behind the bond date, uh, you would only have accrued interest on the bond sale of less time than if it had been issued on the actual bond date. Bond price. This is the current market price of a bond exclusive of any accrued interest. And bond proceeds are the sum of the bond price 
and any accrued interest that may have occurred. Now we're going to move forward and we're going to talk um, about the different types of bonds there are. Uh, there are a variety of bond types that can be issued. Uh, here we have a complete list of them, and I'll give you a little bit of additional information about each type of bond uh, that might be applicable. This is probably one of our longer slides, at least information-wise, and you'll want to take some notes. So starting at the top, we have secured. Secured bonds have a claim to a specific asset that is attached to them. Uh, so they are less risky than the unsecured or the debenture bonds. These are based only on the creditworthiness of the issuing organization. Term bonds. Uh, this is a bond issue where all of the face value um, comes due on the exact same date. And this is different than, say, a serial bond, and this is where when they do the original issue, they will have uh, maturities that are regularly staggered intervals. Uh, so, for example, they may have a certain amount that is maturing every 90 days. Uh, underneath a term, there's a large amount of cash flow that must be accounted for at one given point in time, whereas underneath serial, they stretch it out over a longer period. Uh, callable bonds. Uh, these are bonds where the issuer can retire the bonds before maturity, and it's typically done at a very specified price. Uh, so this amount is greater than par, uh, or greater than face value, and is going to be called the call premium. Uh, sometimes there is a time threshold that is written into the bond indenture, and that says that they can't call them for, say, maybe three years, five years, seven years. Uh, this time threshold uh, results in what's called a deferred call. It means they can't call it right away. Uh, they have to wait until that amount of time expires. And this is called protection uh, for the bond holder. Now, typically... A corporation is not going to call their bonds uh, unless interest rates have really fallen significantly since the bond issue. So this means that the current market interest rates are much lower than the coupon rate. Uh, when that happens, a corporation may call their bonds. Uh, so they're going to pay that call premium and they're going to retire that issue and then I'll Often what happens is that they have a reissue at the lower new interest rate. This results in a lower of cost uh, financing for the organization, so their interest expenses uh, are not as high as they would be underneath the prior issue. Convertible bonds uh, are issues with, are sorry, are an issue that allows the bond to be converted to capital stock by the bond holder. So they can determine that they no longer want to be a creditor, they actually want to be an equity holder, they want to be an owner, and it will turn and instead of being a liability, will become a part of equity. Uh, commodity backed bonds are linked to specific assets. Text has a great explanation of those. Deep discount bonds are bonds that are sold at a discount from the beginning. Uh, the buyer receives the implied interest uh, at maturity. So, for example, at the original issue of a $1,000 bond, uh, perhaps the person only pays $900. They will receive no interest over the term of the bond, uh, but they will get the full $1,000 at maturity. Registered bonds uh, can create a little bit of a complication in that they are actually uh, registered in the names of the holders. So when those change hands, it requires a new certificate to be reissued. Whereas bears or coupon bonds are much easier to transfer uh, because they're not holding on a specific name. 
your income bonds uh, are really interesting because interest is only paid when the company is profitable. Whereas revenue bonds, the interest is paid from a specified revenue source. So as you can see, there's a lot of different types of bonds. And these are just common bonds that are found in practice. There are more specialty bonds that come into play. Um, we're not talking about municipality bonds here, but the basics of bonds apply whether it's corporate or municipality. Uh, the terminology will be the same. It's the different types and the provisions that may come in uh, differently. Uh, as you're aware, we are only really focused right now on the corporate side of everything. Uh, if you have interest in government or nonprofit type uh, of accounting, there is a specific class for that uh, offered here at CMC and at other institutions. So that actually wraps up kind of our uh, I would almost call this our bond review. So all of this information you received in prior classes at some point, you may have only been exposed to one piece of it here and one piece of it there. Uh, but this is uh, Bond Basics 101. Uh, we're going to really work into looking at uh, some additional information after that. So we did talk about uh, the different information that relates to bonds and what different types of bonds there are. Uh, when you look at a corporate bond listing, it's going to give you this specific information. So it's going to tell you the company name, uh, the maturity date of the actual bond, because uh, they'll have their original, uh, you know, they might be a 20 year bond. Uh, maybe there's only eight years left on it. What the amount in billions is of the listing. Uh, this is the face of maturity value. So on uh, August 15th, 2037, Walmart stores will have to pay out $3 billion uh, in face value on this bond uh, listing here. This is the price as a percentage of par. Uh, so this is at 145.4%. Uh, so these are currently selling at a premium. Uh, this is the coupon rate. And the coupon rate of the Walmart bond is 6.5%. So annually, uh, they will pay interest of 6.5%. Uh, this may be in semi-annual payments, which would be 3.25% each. And this is the interest rate based on the price currently. So this yield is an amount that they're calculating and letting you know what you can theoretically expect based off these prices uh, if nothing else was to change. So this actually wraps up your first lecture. Uh, I think we probably have about 20, 30 minutes into this. Uh, we'll then do a completely separate lecture that deals with the valuation and the accounting for bonds payable. Uh, we may touch on this some in class as well uh, because this is some really important information and you want to be able to do these calculations because as accountants you're going to need to. Um, on top of this, uh, you're also going to have all of this type of information on maybe your CPA exam. And I want you to be as prepared as I can get you. Um, you will have covered, again, like I said, some of this, at least at a low level in prior classes. You will also have covered this information if you've taken your finance class from another perspective. Uh, now we're going to look at it from the accounting side um, and work on uh, some of the reasoning and theory that is attached to it as well. Uh, it does take into account our friend the time value of money, which I'm sure everybody is thrilled about, um, but you'll get a little bit more practice of that here in this chapter. Thank you, and we'll see you in the next lecture.